We begin in verse 1 of chapter 37 of Ezekiel. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. This is where it starts to get really good. Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it declares the Lord. I would point out a couple of things regarding context. This takes place during the time of the exile. Israel is not in their homeland. In fact, in in chapter 1, verse 1, Ezekiel says, I was an exile with them. I I was among the exiles. When God calls him out and makes him a prophet, calls him to be a prophet, that's important to remember as we go forward. God had promised to take Israel back to their homeland. But Israel, it seems, they're not listening to that. They're not hearing that. And why would they? These are people who've been fooled by false prophets and false spiritual leaders for years. In fact, Ezekiel 34 says quite a lot about that. And we're going to get to that in the text today. It's also important to note that in our text, Ezekiel previously had had a vision of life and abundance But now he'd been taken from chapter 36 into chapter 37. He's been taken to a plot of land covered with the remnants of death. And not just death, but death from a very great battle. This is not, by the way, a sermon that is going to make you feel good about yourself. But it's my hope for all of us, myself included, that we come away from the message today with a better understanding of the sovereignty of God Almighty and a willingness to follow through on His commands. And that above all, we glorify Him, we worship Him for who He is from a greater understanding of who we are not. That we understand that as Jesus told His disciples in John 15, 5, apart from Him, we can do nothing. That like John the Baptist said, He must increase, I must decrease. Ezekiel's been taken to this valley filled with dry bones, the dry bones of dead men, dead men in need of resurrection. But Ezekiel is not the one who resurrects these men. God does it. As he has for many of you, for myself, 
and as he will continue to do until the time of the ultimate end. Those of us who are in Christ must be like Ezekiel, preaching in the valley of dry bones, praying in the valley of dry bones with a passion for the valley of dry bones. Because simply, if you're you're taking notes, you might want to write this down, dead men still need resurrection. Dead men still need to hear the word of the Lord. And they need to believe. Dead men still need our prayers. Dead men still need us to have a passion to reach them if they are to be resurrected. You remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 14. It says, how will they hear without a preacher? If they do not hear, they cannot believe. If they do not believe, they cannot, they will not be resurrected. So we preach in the valley. We go back to verses 1 and 2. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. Ezekiel the prophet is taken and set down in this valley of death. In fact, he makes it very clear that he gets a good look at the valley, right? Because God has taken him among the bones round about. There there were very many on the surface. He's gotten close enough. He knows they're dry. These are old bones. They've been left out in the sun way too long. Dried up by the time and by heat. No life exists within the bones. Now Israel, if they're hearing this, Israel's going to draw a connection here to the Old Testament law, to Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, God says, if you are obedient, there is a blessing. But if you are disobedient, I believe actually the word he uses, when you are disobedient, when you chase after other idols, when you rebel against me, There is a curse. And the Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them, but you will flee seven ways before them. You will be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses will be food to all the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. Make no mistake about this. Commentators and theologians and Bible scholars They love to argue about this chapter, but one thing they all agree on, these bones are the remnants of a great battle. He is looking at the greatest pile heap, the bones of losers. That's what he's looking at. They are dead men. They have suffered a humiliating loss. They are under a curse. Their bones are left in the the valley and nobody cares enough to bury them. Nobody dared enough to do them the dignity of a funeral. Just as Deuteronomy says, they're an example of terror to anyone who might happen upon this valley or know where it's at. That's what happens when people rebel against God Almighty. This gets echoed in Jeremiah Jeremiah 7, verses 33 and 34. It says, the dead bodies of this people, and he's talking about Israel, will be food for the birds, I'm sorry, he's talking about uh, Judah, which is part of Israel, uh, will be food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Then I will make to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land will become a ruin. You understand their disobedience brings a curse, and the curse cost them their joy, their gladness, and it became a valley of death. In the same way, these bones are under the same judgment, the same wrath the nation, as the nation of Israel, who was under judgment. They'd experienced the wrath of Almighty God. They're in exile because of their chasing after other gods, because of their idolatry, their disobedience, their forsaking of the widow and the poor. They've been ripped from their homes. They've been taken into other nations and forced to live as servants and slaves. Everything that they had, their house, their belongings, their land, their fields, everything was left behind. 
So God asks Ezekiel a question. He says, He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. The obvious answer is no. Lord, they're very dry. They've been dead for a long, long time. There is no amount of electricity or Frankensteinery that's going to bring these men back to breathing. It's not going to happen. That's the obvious answer. But God. You understand those are the two most powerful words in the English language. But God is not asking Ezekiel for the evidence. He's not asking for his opinion on whether or not they can be brought back to life. Ezekiel knows they possibly could. He's familiar with the story of Elijah in 1 Kings and Elisha in 2 Kings, but God's not asking him about that. He's not asking him, what's the science tell you, Ezekiel? He's not asking, Ezekiel, what does your heart tell you can happen here? God is asking Ezekiel, can these bones live? You understand, he is asking Ezekiel for his faith. Ezekiel's response, though, it's going to show his humility, his lack of knowledge, his own limits, his own ignorance, if you will. It's a very guarded response that's going to put the proverbial ball back in God's court. You notice he doesn't say, oh God, you know they can. He doesn't say, oh God, you know they can't. He simply says, oh God, you know. Ezekiel is saying, in other words, I know I can't do it. I don't know anyone else but you, Lord, who can make this happen. You see, Ezekiel is not all-knowing. God is. Ezekiel is not all-powerful. God is. Ezekiel is not all places at all times. God is. Ezekiel doesn't know who these bones are, who they were, how they got there, but God does. So he defers to the Lord and he simply says, you know. This is a statement of submission to the Lord who knows everything. Church, hear me on this. This is one of the most powerful prayers you can pray. You may not be able to say much more than simply, Lord God, you know. You may not be able to list all the hurts, all the doubts, all the needs, all the sins, all the shames, all the shortcomings, but you can pray, oh Lord God, you know. Powerful prayer. We hear it come from the mouth of Peter. Jesus asks him two times. He says, Peter, do you love me? Twice, Jesus is going to say this. And twice, Peter's response is going to be, just he's just going to say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Until finally, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter's grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Peter's saying, Lord, you have searched my heart. You have searched my mind. You know the answer. And so Jesus says, okay, then tend my sheep. You see, when we see this statement in Scripture, it is said to acknowledge the limits of the person and the vastness of God. He alone knows, can or will these bones live? This is the question. This is the question that all men, all women must be asked. Can these bones live? If there's to be any hope, any chance at life, is God the one who will restore you, resurrect you, redeem you, or will you continue to flail around trying to do it yourself? You know, there are plenty who teach self-help, and they preach self-help. Plenty of motivational speakers who will tell you what they think you need to do in order to live your best life possible, but it is God through Jesus Christ who, who can make dead men live again. Only God can resurrect dry bones. So God sends a prophet to the valley of dry bones, and he tells him, 
Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. And Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. You understand Ezekiel hears the word of the Lord, and so he takes the word of the Lord, and he speaks the word of the Lord to dead men in a valley of death. You understand Ezekiel is preaching in this valley. He's preaching as a dying man to dead men. He's giving them the very word of God. Pastors do this every Sunday, by the way. It's the Richard Baxter quote. He's famous. It says, I preached as never sure to preach again as a dying man to dying men. Now, some self-help guru out there is going to hear this uh, chapter, read this chapter, and he's going to say, see, you want to get out of the valley? you got to preach your way out of the valley. No, don't do that. That's not what's happening here. God says, I will put the sinews on you. If you're truly in the value or in the valley, you're dead. You're in rebellion. You're the dry bones. You need to hear the word of the Lord more than anybody. Let's not forget this is not the valley of emotional despair. This is not the valley of stress or depression or anxiety or unhappiness or discomfort. This is the valley of death. Not the valley of the shadow of death or a valley of darkness. It is a valley of dried up, decaying, spent, sun-bleached bones. This death was brought by disobedience, by rebellion towards God, by chasing after idols. And if you're in that valley, you're the last person that should be trying to preach. You're the first person that needs to listen to preaching and spend some time at the altar before God pleading with Him, Lord, breathe your life into me again. That's the point. Dead men still need resurrection. That's what Ezekiel's preaching. These are bones that cannot save themselves. So dry bones, hear. He says, hear the word of the Lord. In the valley. And so Ezekiel preaches. And then he's going to pray. Verse 7 begins, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them. And flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. So Ezekiel is obedient and he preaches and God does what God does best. He begins to create. He creates something out of literally nothing. He brings the sinews and the the muscles and the flesh upon these bones. Now the first part, the first part of this to Ezekiel, that's another day at the office. Like I said, This is what prophets did then. It's what preachers do now. They exhort lifeless people to listen to God's word. And God follows through on his word. Like Isaiah makes clear, he says, So will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth, that will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So Ezekiel has spoken God's word. He has preached God's word. He has prophesied God's word, and God, true to his nature, is faithful to his word. No surprises, right? What is a surprise is there's a noise. The Hebrew word there is whole, and its literal meaning is a voice, a thunder, and it's followed by a rattling. The Hebrew word is rahash, and it means an earthquake. In fact, the King James translation says shaking, and that's probably better suited because this rattling is not the bones. It's the very earth that begins to quake. 
These are signs of God's judgment, by the way. We see it in Revelation during the time of the tribulation, like Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. We see it again in the very next chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38, 19. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare, there's the voice, on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The text makes very clear, Ezekiel prophesied, then comes the noise. Then comes the rattling. The rattling is not the bones clanking and clapping together side by side. The rattling is of the valley itself. Ezekiel said, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and the earth moves. And the bones come together. They get closer to each other. You know, when we read this, so many times we get this mental images of skeletons just rattling, right? Get that out of your head. That's not what's happening. These bones are coming together in order, in a perfectly controlled, knitted way. God is not putting puzzle pieces together that he's never seen before. This is the creator putting together familiar parts like he has done since the beginning of time. And he begins to cover the bones with sinew muscles, skin. In an instant, these bones came together off the floor of the valley and became corpses. The bodies are together, but they've got no life. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. John Taylor says it like this. The second action was tantamount to praying. As Ezekiel besought the Spirit of God to effect the miracles of recreation, to breathe into man's nostrils the breath of life, this time the effect was devastating. What preaching by itself failed to achieve, prayer made a reality. I'll say that again. What preaching fails to achieve, prayer makes a reality. The four winds that are mentioned here are all four corners of the earth. It represents the omniscience of God. Again, it's showing how small the prophet, how powerless he truly is to make these bones live again. And if you notice throughout this entire vision, throughout this entire exchange, Ezekiel has only acted under orders from God. He has not done a single thing under his own strength, under his own power, or his own volition. He's obedient, and he carries out God's word, not his. What does that tell us? That obedience brings resurrection. The obedience brings revival. True revival is God's work. It is not ours. It is God's from start to finish. If man plays any part in it, it is only that of being in obedience. If you want revival, pray. You want dry bones to live again? Pray. You want to see them come to life? Preach and pray and prepare until you see it happen was Leonard Ravenhill who said, no man can plan a revival. We can pray for it. We can preach for it. We can have a passion for it, but only God brings it. In Acts chapter 2, what happens? When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They were gathered together for prayer. There may come a time where we're going to wish we could pray together as a church, where we would have the opportunity because the opportunities have gotten much more slim, much harder. There's going to come a time where we may long for the times we had the option to go to Thursday night prayer or come in on a Sunday morning and pray early. We want to see a revival. We want to see dry bones live in the valley. Pray. The spirit, by the way, or the breath, the same word. It's the Hebrew word ruach. 
And did you notice it moves when we pray, when Ezekiel prays? The New Testament equivalent is the word pneuma. Acts 2.42 says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were having church. They even threw in a potluck. Devoting themselves to the preaching and the teaching of God's word, fellowship, and to prayer. You want to see dry bones live? There has to be preaching in the valley. There has to be prayer in that valley as well. You know, sermons on Ephesians 6 and the armor of God, they are a dime a dozen. I literally have two full-grown men, pastor friends, who have authentic Roman armor as illustrations propped up in their, in their pastor offices, which is fine. I'm just a little jealous. But the undergarment gets missed all the time in those sermons because Ephesians 6.18 tells us, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Under the undergarment of that armor is prayer. Your armor will chafe without prayer. Your armor will not have the padding it needs without prayer. You will not have the flexibility or the mobility to raise your shield without prayer or swing your sword without prayer. The problem is the church today, we want all the benefits of prayer, but we don't want to pray. Lord, we want you to send your rain, but you only say that on Sunday morning. When are you praying? We want God to provide. We don't pray. We want God to move, but we don't pray. We want revival, but we don't pray. You want to see dead men live? Pray. It's not, you've heard me say this a thousand times, it is not the last resort of the Christian. It is the lifestyle of the Christian to pray. It's what Christ models for us. It's what we see in the church in the book of Acts. It's what we hear the apostles constantly affirming in the epistles. Paul says, pray without ceasing. James says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Again, if you're in the valley, you're completely dead. Hear the word of the Lord and call out to him, then pray. But if you want to see someone come out of that valley, pray for them. You know they're dead. You know they need the breath of life. You know what they profess, but you also know how they live. I have never met so many Lutherans who don't go to church since I moved to Lisbon. That's not a knock. Same could be said for Catholics, Methodists, Assembly of Gods. That's my church. We, I have not seen, I'm the pastor of that church. I haven't seen you in years. I don't even think you were there before that. But that's my church. I'm a Christian. Are you? They are dry bones. Pray for the dry bones in the valley. I like this last line. They came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Church, that is revival. That's what revival looks like. It is not a tent meeting where we get Holy Ghost goosebumps or we have an evangelist come for four nights and then he goes home and everything goes back to normal on Sunday. That's not revival. Revival is where the Holy Spirit fills men and floods men with his presence and they go out from being dead, dry skeletons to being an army advancing the kingdom of the living God. But it does not change without passion for the valley. Verse 11 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. This is where God begins to explain what Ezekiel just saw, what he's just experienced. Now, commentators, like I said, they love to debate, but I think just like in the book of Acts, chapter 8, when the Spirit picks up uh, Philip and, and moves him, I think he's done the same thing with Ezekiel here. Some insist it's literal. Some insist it's a vision. It doesn't matter. Here's what matters. Can these bones live? That's the question we go back to. The nation of Israel thought God was done with them. Their hope was gone. 
Interestingly, Ezekiel just prophesied good things. Remember from the beginning of the sermon? He told them, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into the land, into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. But see, Israel's heard all of this before. They've heard the raw, raw sermons. They've heard the prophets who tell them what their itching ears want to hear. That's Ezekiel 34. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for every beast of the field that were, and were scattered because the shepherds, the people who were in charge of Israel, were getting fat off of Israel. They were, they were manipulating Israel. They were doing what they wanted to do, not listening to the voice of God. If they were, they wouldn't have been doing what they were doing. But he is the good shepherd. For lack of a shepherd, they'd been manipulated and abused. But he is the good shepherd and he will restore them. Israel, the dry bones, could be renewed. They could be redeemed. They could be made completely new. You understand the passion does not begin with us. It begins with God. He has a burning passion for the lost. So much so he sent his only son to die on a cross for them, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God tells Ezekiel in verse 12, he says, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Go be an evangelist with this message, Ezekiel. Go tell the living people, the actual people, what I've said, Ezekiel. Let my passion be your passion, Ezekiel. That's what he's saying here. Go give them the hope that they need. Go tell them that they, they, they need to know that I'm still a God who loves them. I'm still a God who delivers them. I will take that nation of dry bones and I will put my spirit into them. And they're going to come to life. God said it, so it's as good as done. How many of you do not raise your hand? How many of you know some dry bones? that need his spirit within them. We are called to evangelize to them, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. The, uh, I hope you understand this. The beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that he came to make bad people good or poor people rich or ugly people pretty. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that God came to earth and died on a cross so that dead men, dry bones, can live. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Through the cross, we have that life. Through the cross of Christ, we have a Savior who took death and the wrath that we deserved upon himself. Through the cross, we've been made alive. We've been set free from the bondage of our sin and our shame and made right before a holy and righteous God. But the story doesn't end at the cross. There's a resurrection. And this is where the story gets good. The Apostle Paul said, he's quoting Hosea. He says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the power of the death and resurrection of Christ, we are dry bones no more. Nobody stays dry bones if they're in Christ. Death has lost. Death has no victory, no hold on us. That's why Jesus and the apostles, when you read the New Testament, why do they keep calling it sleeping? Why do they keep saying they've fallen asleep? Because to the Christian, that's all it is. In John 11, Jesus tells the disciples, he's talking about Lazarus. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that, he, so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples don't get it, so Jesus has to dumb it down a little. Does the thing I do, explain this to me like I'm five, Jesus. 
Lazarus is dead. But why does he call it sleeping? Because Jesus understands the resurrection. Paul constantly talks about those who've fallen asleep because he understands the resurrection. The Christian understands the resurrection in a spiritual sense because we have been resurrected spiritually, but we look forward to the day where we are resurrected physically. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And he goes on, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. When we are in Christ, we are not the dry bones. We are the ones who are to be preaching and praying and have a passion for those who are. And look just a moment back at verse verses 13 and 14. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit within you when you, you will come to life. I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. That spirit that he's talking about, the Holy Spirit, takes that passion from God and he gives it to us. And with it comes a power. That's Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Where is our power? It's hard for the world to believe that he is our God if our lives do not reflect it. Church, hear me and get used to hearing this as we move forward. Your life imitates your theology. What you think about God, what you believe about God, who you think Jesus is, who you think Jesus was, what you think about the Holy Spirit, what you believe about what the Holy Spirit can or should do through you is reflected in your life. So preach to the dry bones, pray for the dry bones, and be passionate about the dry bones. Those dead men still need a resurrection. I'm going to move to close in just a moment. If you're in Christ, you are not dry bones. The thing is, you're not Ezekiel either. You're you. And if the Spirit of God re resides in you, it's the same spirit that filled Ezekiel, and it's the same spirit from Acts chapter 2. It's the Ruach of the living God. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want the fire. We want the tongues. We, we want the spiritual gifts that come with it. But where's our passion that comes with it? Where's our passion for the valley? Where's our prayer for the valley? Where is our preaching in the valley. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sincerely ask yourself, am I a preacher in the valley? Am I praying? Am I passionate? If you've not received it, I would challenge you to seek it, to pray for it. You do not need it to be saved, to be clear, but God will ignite a passion within you for the dry bones that you have never experienced before. Maybe you're here and you're spiritually dead and you're saying, that's me. My life is dry. I have no relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Grab one of the greeters. Grab someone on the prayer team who comes forward. But pray and do not leave here dry bones. Before we close, I want to give just a quick word of caution. And you may think what I'm about to say is meant to be humorous. I assure you it is not. If you leave this service today and you go out north of town and you stand in the cemetery and you start trying to rise up dead bodies from those gravestones, you have missed the point of this entire message. But if you walk out of here and you say, I'm good, I've done enough, or I do enough, you've also missed it by just as much. Church, we are surrounded by a county filled to the brim with dry bones. Dead men and dead women who still need a resurrection. Does your heart burn for them? Do you pray for them? Do you preach 
to them. Because if not, chances are you are one of them. Heavenly Father, we just thank you because you are good. You are faithful. And Lord, we pray that you use us in the valley. That we hear your word, that we read your word, that we understand your word, that it become a part of our life and that we reflect what we believe about you to the world around us. Father, that you begin something new. That you bring a revival, Father God. It cannot come under our strength, but it has to be through yours. If it comes about by men, it will die and it will be dead again. But if it is the spirit of the living God, nothing will stop it. And so, Lord, we pray, advance your kingdom today, Father God. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.